I'm very happy to to have uh, Professor Mihail uh, Kritikov today to discuss uh, his new work. It's part of our uh, series, lecture series on minorities in the region. Uh, before I introduce him formally, I would ask you all to make sure that your cell phones are turned off. And now, uh, Mihail uh, Kritikov is professor of Slavic and Judaic studies. He's currently serving also as the chair of the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Michigan. He graduated from Moscow State University with, degree, with a degree in mathematics, which I did not know. Uh, has a graduate diploma in Yiddish, Yiddish literature from Gorky Institute for Literature in Moscow. Has a PhD in Jewish literature from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Before joining the University of Michigan, he held positions at Oxford and at the University of London. A scholar of Yiddish lit literature and East European Jewish culture, he has published two books, Yiddish Fiction and the Crisis of Modernity, 1905-1914, published by Stanford University Press in 2001, and From Kabbalah to Class Struggle, Expressionism, Marxism, and Yiddish Literature in the Life and Work of Nir Wiener, uh, also published by Stanford University Press in 2011. This last work was awarded the very prestigious MLA Fenya and Yaakov Leviant Memorial Prize uh, in Yiddish Literature. And he's currently at work on a third monograph uh, entitled A Witness to the People, Their Nister and Soviet Yiddish Literature under Stalin. 1929 to 1949, which will appear in 2017, perhaps closer to 2018, uh, with Indiana University Press. As if uh, he were not prolific enough, he has also co-edited nine collected uh, volumes in the Jewish study series of Legenda Press at Oxford. He's a regular contributor to the Yiddish Forward, and he's co-editor also of the Indiana Press University um, uh, University, Indiana University Press series, Jews in Eastern Europe. His talk today on Jewish voices in Ukraine and Russia is part of our lecture series on minorities in Eastern Europe and Eurasia. Please join me in offering a warm, warm welcome to Professor Kritikov. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anivia, for, uh, for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, so, as I think it uh, happens, I've changed slightly the title of my talk. Uh, so now what I did, um, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I wasn't sure. Uh, so it's not from, uh, it's not in Russia and Ukraine, but from Russia and Ukraine, which really extends, I think, uh, vastly the geographic scope of my uh, presentation. So um, it's, uh, I wouldn't describe it as a work in uh, uh, progress. I think it's a work in process because I don't think it has any uh, ending. It's an open-ending project that um, I started about 20 years ago. And I am currently, I'm revise, uh, reviewing um, works that come out on um, some, broadly speaking, Russian Jewish theme in different languages uh, for the Yiddish uh, forwards. Uh, which is read by a very small number of people. It's in Yiddish, so I can basically say whatever I want. Uh, and I can be sure that the authors will not read what I say about them, which give me a lot, gives me a lot of freedom. But uh, occasionally, I do that kind of survey. So this is one of them. And what I'm trying to do um, now is to describe a certain phenomenon that I'm mm, observing. I think it's becoming visible in the past maybe 10 years. So I'm, I'm going to discuss about four examples and then try to come to some mm, sort of um, uh, conclusion. Uh, so Soviet Jewish theme, uh, Jewish theme became popular in Russian literature in the 90s. Um, first because Jews were no longer taboo, but also because of the mass immigration of Soviet Jews to Israel, Germany, and North America, which made this theme uh, relevant for many uh, people. The most prominent figure that rose out of this combined interest uh, was, or is, uh, still the writer named Dina Rubina, a prolific and engaging uh, author who made a remarkable uh, literary career in Russia and abroad after the immigration to Israel. So it's, it's very important that she became prominent in Russia after she immigrated to Israel and then precisely because she created this 
new persona of a Russian-Israeli immigre writer. But she's not part of my discussion today. So very schematically, uh, just to put things in the broader, the broader context, I can identify three thematic concerns uh, in uh, what I describe as um, post-Soviet uh, Jewish writing. First, it's um, the great historical transformation, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the communist ideology, the emergence of new mm, independent nation states, and mass immigration of Soviet uh, Jews. And that was um, quite uh, prominent in the 90s. I can mention just a few uh, titles. Rubin's novel, his first Israeli novel, Here Comes the Messiah. Uh, Lyudmila Ulitska's Merry Funeral, Vesoli um, Pohrene. Um, the trilogy by Alek Yuryev, less known, but I think maybe a more interesting writer. Then the second uh, theme is a personal adventure story of adaptation to the new environment, a sort of picaresque buildings roman. And uh, this is more prominent in English and German than in Russian, and actually they don't really do well in uh, Russian translations. These authors, I think Gary Steingart is a well-known example in Germany. It's Vladimir Kaminer. And finally, the third thing, which is the topic of my today's uh, presentation, it is a, what I describe as Soviet Jewish family saga, a traditional genre, of course, a family saga that uh, became again prominent a few years ago. And an important feature of that um, genre um, is in, in, in this contemporary um, reincarnation is its claim to authenticity uh, supported by some documentary autobiographical material. So, it can be real or imaginary, but all four authors that I'm going to discuss today, they all use something real, some kind of document, some kind of person. So um, I'm going to speak about three, about four different authors who write in three different languages, um, each one in one language, uh, trying to make connection between them and to highlight their most prominent features and in particular examine their contemporary relevance. So that's who is listening. Um, so, my first exhibit is Boris Yersonsky, who was born, as you can see, in 1950, and he lives in Odessa. He was born in Odessa. Uh, he's a prominent Russian poet, a practicing psychi psychiatrist and psychotherapist from Odessa, and a devout Orthodox Christian. He's also the most Jewish poet, I think, in contemporary Russian literature. Judaism as religion, his own Jewishness, and his extended Jewish family are central to his work. Christianity comes through in his Jewish poetry as a subtle, in a subtle symbolic way, uh, rarely directly related to the thematic content of his uh, poems. Um, here is the collection that I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, it's uh, titled Family Archive. It was published by the prestigious NLO Press in Moscow in the series Poetry of Russian Diaspora, which is now a discontinued, but that was 2006. Um, as we can see from mm, the cover, and that's the book, that's the cover, but what I did, I just got off of it like this. Um, it's based on old family photographs, uh, but the photographs themselves are not part of the book. They only appear on the cover. On the cover. Uh, some of those relatives are well familiar to the author, others are barely known. Poems like photographs have a date and a place, often two days and two places uh, in their titles and tell a brief story of a person or persons or on that, that imaginary picture that we don't really get to see. It's very much like one would uh, take a family uh, photo and then tell maybe a few stories and anecdotes, something that is remembered, and maybe that's all that remains from mm, that uh, person. Of course, Kersonsky is a very skillful uh, poet, and he is also very well versed in psychoanalysis. So all his images and metaphors are very carefully crafted, and they invite all kinds of Freudian interpretation uh, that are kind of embedded in them. Um, most of Khersonsky's poems are said, ending um, up in the Holocaust or the Gulag. Many tell us about losses, about old age, physical and mental uh, degradation, and he's very good at precisely diagnosing all kinds of diseases. Uh, there is no sweet nostalgia for the past, but a great deal of melancholy, remembering a generation of Jews who have disappeared with very little traces. The mm, sequence of poems about individual relatives is broken by a few poems titled Auction of Judaica, which depict in great detail precious Jewish religious objects uh, offered for sale. All that is left from mm, the past are objects, are things which outlive their owners. 
um, he has a great line here in uh, Russian linking uh, vechnost eternity and vechnost materiality. So I don't know if people can uh, hear that kind of subtle difference in, in sibilance. Бытие металла однообразнее, но дольше наших жизней, похоже, вечность угрюмо перерастает в вечность. The being of metal is more monotonous but lengthier than our lives. Apparently, materiality is somberly growing into eternity. And this is, I think, the central motive of his uh, poetry. Uh, indeed, in his region, uh, and he is also very precise with geography, it's Galicia, Podolia, and Bessarabia. So it's southern Ukraine and today's Moldova, where his family is from. And there, of course, we know that objects, especially useful and expensive ones, uh, like furniture or jewelry, are more valuable and desirable than people who are disposable. Uh, poems about things are juxtaposed by poems that imitate Jewish prayers, starting in a traditional formal way, but ending with some kind of uh, improvisation. For example, one example, Blessed are thou, our God, King of the universe, who has protected us, sustained us, and kept us alive to this day. We will be better off without, without seeing that day. That's his ending. Um, so he, he's really, he's, he knows his Judaism really quite well. The mm, opening poem in that collection is titled Kremenets, June 1910, and chronologically that's the beginning. And it is set at the background of a ruined Polish castle. Two girls, one of them the poet's grandmother, throw stones into a deep well, uh, waiting to hear them uh, hit the bottom, but no sounds come back. Instead, Hersonsky offers us uh, his book as a kind of a polyphonic, poetic echo uh, from that um, past. Uh, the closing poem, um, so I have no time, of course, to discuss this whole book, this whole collection, which is really worth uh, discussing. Mm. The uh, closing poem is titled Brooklyn, August 1997, A Dream. Uh, and it is about the uh, death of his uh, father, who had immigrated to the United States in the early 90s, and he died in Brooklyn in 97. Uh, it concludes with the image of a rough marble tombstone from which all the inscriptions have been erased. So uh, Hersonsky himself uh, decided not to immigrate to the United States uh, with his uh, parents and his sister, although he visited them a couple of times. And um, as he notes in one of other poems, he has changed his um, homeland without changing his um, apartment. Uh, but then he added, of course, ironically, I changed my apartment, but that was later. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooklyn, uh, where Wyshevsonsky visited several times, is associated with complete dissolution of memory as it is absorbed by the sands on Brighton Beach. So there's a poem about the sand that takes in everything. Uh, but uh, Brighton Beach, not the end of Hersonsky's family saga. The thread is picked up by his niece, Yelena Akhtyorska, uh, who was born in Odessa, in, uh, so she is the daughter of his sister, in uh, 1985 and immigrated with her family to the US, United States in 1993. Um, I believe she's now studying at Columbia Medical School and continuing the four generations or five generations of family tradition of uh, doctors. Uh, but he also published a novel, a debut novel, Panic in, Suit, in a Suitcase. Uh, it came out in, um, 19, in 2014, where she uh, presented her poet uncle as the main character under the name of Pasha Nasmertsev. The first part describes Pasha's first visit to her, his parents' and sister's family in Brighton Beach, soon after their immigration in the mid-90s. At that time, the autobiographical narrator named Frida in the novel was about 10 years old, um, and in New York, Pasha attended uh, Russian Bohemian Literary Salons, where he met uh, with some of his old acquaintances. The family was even paid a visit by the chair of Russian department from Harvard, and the uh, dinner ends up a, a disaster because Frida is throwing a tantrum uh, at the dinner table, apparently as an expression of her deep-seated frustration with her and her family's inferior immigrant status. Unimpressed and underappreciated by America, Pasha returns to Odessa. His presence in the old country offers some psychological comfort to uh, for his Brighton Beach family, and I quote, uh, it was permission to stay sane. Uh, ties hadn't been severed. Odessa remained theirs, end of quote. The second part takes place 15 years later uh, and depicts Frida's trip to Odessa. There, she finds her uncle as an object of a cult. Uh, he is praised as, I quote, the Brodsky of our time, the Ragoidruk and Veliki poet, dear friend and great poet. That's, she writes it in, in Russian. 
in her English text, whose poetry built uh, emotions through a fantastic accrual of detail, which is quite a good description, I think. Odessa, his admirers tell her, is not the right place for him. This town has been abandoned by his, I quote, this town has been abandoned by history and didn't need a martyr in the shape of an aging, bearded Russian Jewish Christian poet. Uh, end of quote. Later, after she had uh, some taste of Pasha's disorderly and turbulent life in um, Odessa, she even for a few moments uh, contemplated writing his biography as she um, um, thinks she was the most suitable person for that uh, task. So secluded in the communal toilet, um, she even opened a book of his poetry and I quote, began to make fumbling attempts to decipher the Cyrillic, end of quote. But then somebody else needs to use the toilet and she has to leave and abandon the project. So in an interview to the Jewish literary website, The Pros and People, Akhtorsky describes both Frida and Pasha, um, essentially herself and Hersonsky, as belonging to the category of people who tend to be, I quote, miserable, unbearable, and isolated, end of quote, regardless of where they are, in a quote. The outside world made of crowds and noise is there to be bristled against and pushed out, end of quote. She seems to imply that immigration doesn't change the deep foundation of one's personality, but may affect uh, one's reaction to the outside, as she calls it, noise. Arturska Frida has inherited her creativity from her uncle and successfully converted into an American novel. Uh, the connection actually brings to mind Yuri Tinyanov's idea of uh, literary evolution, which proceeds from uncles to nephews rather than from parents to children. So it's kind of indirect line of um, inheritance. Pasha's portrayals is a lovely uh, caricature of uh, the Russian poet stereotype, which drastically simplifies the complexity of Hersonsky personality uh, and actually uh, ignores his poetry that also ignores for some reason his um, medical practice. So she, he doesn't really uh, act as a, as a doctor in the, um, in the novel. Akhtyorska, on the other hand, comes out as an ironic, sophisticated, and sensitive young American heiress to the grand Russian literary tradition. When asked by the interviewer about her readings, she replies that she reads almost exclusively writers who are, I quote, Jewish, Russian, or Russian Jewish, and dead. Panic in a Suitcase uh, received favorable reviews in the mainstream American press, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. The Vogue reviewer posed a rhetorical question, I quote, do we need another Bosch-centered plot light novel about globalization or returning all the old immigration narratives? And then answers, apparently yes, <laughs> we do, especially one this funny and true through the Nasmerzas, we understand the absurdity and ambivalence of not quite belonging, the thrilling promise of a new place mixed with the yearning for home that, as they come to realize, exists only in memory. So we have here Borscht with deterritorialization, with the Luz and Guattari in the right proportion that I think really pleases mm, the broad audience. So uh, my next, uh, this is the third example, is um, even greater success, I think, than Aktorska's novel Head in America, was enjoyed by the book titled Vielleicht Esther, Maybe Esther, uh, published 2013 by Katya Petrovska, who was born in 1917, uh, um, in uh, Kiev. It won the prestigious Ingeborg Bachmann Prize and had been translated into a dozen of languages, including Ukrainian, but not yet English or Russian. Uh, part fiction, part memoir, this book is a quest for the family past. Like Akhtyorska, Petrovska comes from a literary family. Uh, her father is a well-known uh, Russian literary scholar, Miron Petrovsky, who lives in Kiev. She studied Russian literature at the University of Tartu, so I presume with Lotman. Uh, she wrote her PhD thesis at the um, Moscow State University on Vladislav Hadasevich. Um, uh, so she knows her craft. Uh, Vielleicht Esther combines two narrative lines which run in the opposite directions uh, in different time zones. Uh, in the present, the narrator travels from her new home in Berlin eastward uh, to Poland in search of family roots, whereas in the past, uh, layer. Her old Russian self is relieving what she describes as the, I quote, exemplary family story. So translations and minds are not really great, I think. Uh, uh, family story of her Russian-speaking, fully assimilated uh, Jewish uh, family. Her father belongs to what she describes as nation of readers, rather than to any ethnic or religious group. Uh, the family's Jewish legacy um, 
personified in a multitude of uh, so-called authentic Jewish relatives seem ephemeral to her like uh, the mm, fireflies of, of the past, that's her mm, words. Um, in the introduction to her novel, she muses that her ancestors had moved to the East, and I quote, perhaps to, for the only reason of leaving me the legacy of the Russian language, which I so majestically pass on to nobody else. That's a dead end and um, complete stop. So there's a lot of reflection on language. Why um, is she writing in German rather than in her native uh, Russian? Uh, but she has also inherited, uh, perhaps subconsciously, the legendary legacy of many generations of Jews who lived in Lodz, Krakow, Vienna, Warsaw, Paris, and Kiev. Remarkably, nobody comes from the shtetl. Uh, they surrounded her and, I quote, murmured their joyous messages to her languages that sounded familiar, end of quote. In a way, reminding, of course, Hersonsky's uh, poetic reconstruction of his family archive. The foundational urtext uh, of Petrovska's family history uh, was an article in the Lemberg Yiddish newspaper, mid-19th century, about the school of deaf, mute children that her ancestor had founded. It was later translated into Russian, but the original had been lost. Thus, Petrovska explains, again I quote, the origins of our family are grounded in a questionable translation with no original, and therefore I am now telling the story of this family in German without ever having a Russian original, end of quote. Petrovska, is fashion, fa Petrovska fashions her story on the mm, pattern of exile and return, whereby translation shows a way of return to the original, to that kind of German Yiddish original that had been lost, bringing her back from the exile in Kiev to a kind of new homeland in Berlin, from Russian to German. And while she has been recovering her cultural roots in German, her brother, uh, whom some people may know is Professor Johanan Petrovsky Stern from uh, Northwestern University. Uh, her brother, um, mm, yes, uh, chose a different Hebrew uh, route back, and I quote, his Hebrew and my German, those languages changed, changed our path through life. Both of them have drifted away from their secular Soviet Russian past culturally and linguistically. And then I quote, through these languages, my brother and I together created a counterweight to our origins. So in German, Angleichgewicht gegen unsere Herkunft. What she leaves out, interestingly, there is her brother's appropriation of Ukrainian that happened before Hebrew in the late Soviet years as a protest gesture against Russian domination. So somehow Ukrainian didn't fit into that mm, narrative. Um, the awareness of her belonging uh, to the uh, Jewish community of faith, as it were, comes to Petrovska in Berlin during a museum visit with her daughter. They stopped before the explanatory table on the 1935 Nuremberg Laws, which defined the degree of racial purity according to the percentage of Jewish blood. Accidentally, they found themselves behind a guided tour group, and listening to the guide's explanation, her daughter asked, I quote, in a loud whisper, where are we here? Where are we in this table? Uh, while the mother is thinking how to explain to her daughter using the correct German subjunctive mood that back then these laws would not have been applicable to them because they would have been living in Kiev. Yes, it's more or less correct translation. Uh, one member of the group uh, snaps at them, quoting, actually we have paid, um, implying that they were trying to enjoy the paid service for free. This accident suddenly makes uh, Petrov, or the author, mm, embrace both the German and the Jewish past as her own and produces an emotional shock, which finds its linguistic expression in a peculiar passive construction where the intransitive verb weinen, or weep or cry, takes on transitive property, ich wurde geweint, as like I was wept, something wept through me. Um, as if an external force has taken control over her faculties and wept through her. And here is a quote, which again, I tried it, my best to translate, but here it is in uh, German, um, I can check. Tears came to my eyes, something wept in me, I was wept, and that man was also wept over in me, uh, even though it was not necessar necessarily because he was right, we have not paid, and yet we have, but there's always someone who has not. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, German critics were very much impressed by Petrovska's emotional double embrace of Jewishness and Germanness in her newly recovered hometown of Berlin. 
in the highly flattering profile in the Liberal Weekly did cite, and this is actually the um, title, this is her quote, we are the last Europeans, so we are the last Europeans. Um, uh, is the mm, review, yes, uh, the, mm, uh, she, uh, uh, she was introduced as a Berlin-based author who, um, and here I quote again, um, reconnects with the specific Eastern colored multi-layeredness of German, um, which is believed to have been lost. So this is a very kind of peculiar, I think, uh, language with this östlich gefärbte Vielschichtigkeit, multi-layeredness of the German language that we kind of re trace, we kind of gain it back through her, even though it's not really her native language. Uh, but that is something that we've been longing for. Mm. After more than a century of suffering and deprivation, surviving the Holocaust and Stalin's regime, her family is finally reunited, as it were, through her with her old new German Jewish homeland. Um, she proudly declares in the title, we are the last European, speaking for the last Soviet generation, which was able to survive the cold European winter in the uh, permafrost of the Eastern Bloc countries. So here it is, uh, it's like Kulturbergenton that is so no in permafrost the Ostblockstaaten überwinter country. So it's a, something very peculiar uh, that survived in that kind of permafrost and now of course is happily uh, defrosted in Berlin. Um, so uh, uh, one detail in Petrovsky's narrative that I think is significant for my mm, analysis is that he, uh, her family tree is rooted in the European soil rather than in the shtetl landscapes of the Russian Pale of Settlement, even though they lived in Kiev. Uh, we find a familiar origin story in uh, Lyudmila Ulitska's novel um, that was um, published, I believe, 2015, uh, titled Lesnitsy Yakova, Jacob's Letter, obviously a very clear biblical reference. Uh, here, the family patriarch Pinchas Kerns uh, arrives in Kiev from Switzerland um, in the second half of the 19th century as a representative of the famous Omega watch firm. His business wasn't successful, but his children retained their European distinctiveness. I quote, all of the Cairns children chipper than French, which made them strange birds. All their compatriots spoke a different tongue. Uh, I can't really help feeling a slight uneasiness about Yiddish in this turn of phrase, because you can't really name Yiddish by name. It's not named directly, but clearly identified for those in the know. In accordance with the common uh, pattern of um, European Jewish bourgeois family, Kant's children discard their commerce and become engaged in Russian radical politics. Uh, his daughter Marusa, the grandmother of the main character of the novel, and presumably based on Ulitska's own grandmother, was saved from the pogrom in October 1905 by the Christian neighbors, and I quote, I quote came uh, out to God's world as a Christ-loving radical another very clear Christian reference. At the age of 16, she began her study to become a kindergarten teacher according to the progressive Froebel method. And similarly to Petrovska, Ulitska portrays her ancestors as bearers of the European values of progress and service to the presumably backward uh, people of Ukraine and uh, Russia. Ulitska's narrative shifts uh, among different uh, time periods and the plot winds around different uh, generations of the family. Uh, mm, forth and back between pre-revolutionary Kiev, Soviet Moscow, and the 21st century uh, New York. So this is a trajectory that we find in all of those uh, texts, um, Ukraine, um, often Russia, either physically or culturally, and then Germany or the United States. Uh, Ulitska calls uh, Jacob's letter a forced novel. She says it's Vinus in the Roman. It was forced upon her by the discovery of the correspondence between her grandparents. And this letter is from the early 20th century. She says in, um, in an interview, and I quote here, um, have pulled me into a space where I got lost. Uh, the, this story lasted four years of my life, end of quote. Uh, the way she describes uh, her textual connection to the past generation Somehow echoes, I think, Petrovska's uh, musings uh, and uh, Hersonsky's as well. I, I, again, I translate it. Sounds a little bit uh, complicated. I quote, we all carry in ourselves texts, in, in um, quotation marks, she puts in quotation marks, that we have received from dead mom or grandfather and grandmother. 
from those ancestors uh, whom uh, we may not remember, but they all exist in us. Jacob's letter, uh, Ulitska tells us, is her last novel which puts an end to her investigation of her family past. But not only her personal family story is finished. Ulitska adds a metaphysical dimension to her family saga by describing this intergenerational meta text as a, a quote, variant of uh, immortality, a variant of smertia. This textual form of immortality signifies the closure of what can be described as the intelligentsia uh, period in Russian history, I quote. The um, intelligentsia has come to an end as a historical phenomenon, she says, uh, meaning intelligentsia in the old Russian sense. At this point of her uh, life and career, Ulitska is skeptical about her ability to fit into the imaginary family of the new, as she calls it, planetary uh, intelligence, uh, and I quote, I have already been a Soviet intelligent. I don't want it anymore. I might not be admitted to the Russian, uh, Ruski uh, intelligent, uh, because of the fifth paragraph, again, referring to her Jewishness, but not uh, openly. And I haven't yet got a sense why the Rossiyski intelligent, who the Rossiyski intelligent are, of course, this is this interesting difference between Ruski and Rossiyski that is, I don't think, is translatable into English. Russian meaning in more ethnic uh, sense, Rossiyski more in a cultural sense. Um, I'd prefer to be a European intelligent, but like Vasil Ivanovich, meaning Chupayev from a joke, I don't know foreign languages. In the end, the only route that is left for this um, waters, four of them, um, is back to um, Europe or to the United States. Uh, Petrovska successfully manages, but Ulitska, of course, cannot because of her age. Uh, so what is... Um, So what are actually telling us, these three mm, writers, they're writing in different styles and different languages. Um, the Russian Jewish intelligence, as we know it, is dead, but its legacy can be salvaged, recycled, and repackaged. It can be passed on to American or German audience, audience or it can uh, dissolve into ecumenical Christianity, like the Old Testament into the um, New Testament. And I think that is what um, mm, uh, Hersonsky does uh, very uh, clearly because all these uh, layers of Jewishness that he still remembers that his family now they're all dead and uh, moving to America actually just covers them with this bright and big um, sand. So the only uh, potential revival would be through a complete transformation, transfiguration, this kind of Christian um, idea. Um, the writers fashion themselves as uh, the last ones in the chain of generations. Someone who uh, is still capable of recovering and um, organizing fragments of the past into a narrative. In America, the younger generation of immigrant writers such as Akhtorska, and she's not the only one, draw on their family experience as uh, uh, Jews in the Soviet Union and re uh, retell it in, um, in the good, good old genre of the immigrant family comedy, spicing it up with the references to Russian high culture. In Germany, Russian Jewish intelligentsia present themselves as the last Europeans, perhaps uh, as the last reflex of the Habsburg nostalgia, and implicitly suggest a positive contrast to foreign immigrants from Middle East and uh, Turkey. Finally, uh, the question was the significance of Ukraine and Russia, if uh, any, in, in all these narratives. Um, as I just s mentioned, the stories have a kind of three-point narrative um, or trajectory. Ukraine is the point of departure, remote both in time and place, which also serves as the source of Jewish authenticity. Russia and Russian culture bring assimilation and loss of Jewish identity in exchange for the sense of belonging to a great uh, cultural tradition. In the standard uh, Russian narrative of assimilation, a good example would be Vasily Grossman's la la Life and Fate. This is a one-way journey of no return from Berdichev to Moscow. In contemporary post-Soviet narrative, uh, Russia uh, often turns into a provisional intermediate space, both culturally and geographically. Leaving Russian culture behind, the protagonists of Akhtorska and Petrovska's uh, novels uh, proceed further west to New York, Berlin, where they recover Jewishness and tell their story to the new audience. Uh, thus, Ukraine and Russia emerge as two distinctly different stages. Ukraine is the site of Jewish authenticity, uh, and, uh, which is only vaguely preserved in the Jewish memory and archives and needs to be reconstructed by the force of artistic imagination. 
it is significant that uh, now I think we can say that Ukraine is the only country in Eastern Europe which still can claim some kind of degree of Jewish continuity. So if you look at contemporary Ukrainian Jews, you can see that they've been there um, for generations. And the characters that emerge uh, are really in a very recognizable. So if you look at Kolomoisky, immediately Babel comes to mind, and I think that's how he is really described, like Benny Creek. Um, uh, so it's, it's a very visible, I think, continuity that, that is really mm, mm, certainly not in a full sense, but um, uh, quite, mm, quite significant. Um, Russian imperial culture is uh, in its, it's a universalist force of acculturation, which suppresses authenticity, but with the collapse of the mm, empire, its power has weakened. However, it is still uh, has a, it still has a value, cultural value. Uh, it can, can cultural capital that can be put to new, uh, use uh, um, for different audiences. Uh, people still respond to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky when you refer to them, and also in like in some of those novels, they also make footnotes. You know, this episode is actually taken from *Crime and Punishment*, so you, you know. Mm, the new narrative uh, uses um, conservative stylistics, and they doesn't confront the reader with uneasy ethical uh, problems. The reader is safely removed in time um, and space from the events. The stories are comforting, regularly familiar, and uplifting. They resolve the grand uh, epic uh, Soviet uh, tragic narrative into local uh, family stories of survival. So, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Misha, for your talk. Um, question about uh, the uh, memoir literature, which became very popular after the collapse of the Soviet Union in Russia and in Russian language. Um, do you see these, these developments, the kind of family saga, sagas that uh, also occupy Russian literary scene? Do you see? Uh, these developments as parallel or dependent on each other or under influence of each other or, or a, an attempt kind of to respond mm -hmm. in a different way to mm -hmm. the same challenges mm -hmm. yeah, of thank you. after the collapse. Right. Uh, that's a good question. I think certainly uh, Ulitska fits very well into that trend and uh, she always feels trends very well. Uh, and definitely, um, Kersonsky is also aware of this. So those writers who write in Russian, and we can name a few more, uh, I think they are part of that trend. Jewishness is just an additional, maybe a little bit exotic, something that makes it more interesting. And it tells the story from a different angle. But you always need, in all memory stories, you need a special angle. That's the beauty. You want to have something special about this family. The uh, writers who write in other languages, I think it's, it's more complicated. Um, first of all, I'm not sure how much they read of that literature. And they definitely write for different audiences. And they write for an audience that is looking not for reliving that kind of Soviet experience in one way or the other, but they're looking for something exotic, but that would also talk to them in a recognizable way. So I think they are kind of catering to that kind of nostalgia need, but it's nostalgia that they don't themselves have. So in, in um, Arturska review, I think it's interesting that she reminds of that immigrant narrative that she doesn't know, it's, she's not part of that tradition of uh, early 20th century Jewish immigrant narratives. For American readers, that's something that they need. Right? For the Germans, the same. They need that kind of good East European, East European uh, Jews who are not contaminated by this whole Nazi past. They can speak in the beautiful Ost, you know, East, Eastern German. Uh, so this is sort of the public nostalgia. So it's, I think it's more carefully crafted, and, and I think it's, it's really uh, interesting how you can tell the same story for three different audiences, really pleasing them in different ways. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about uh, the, all of, uh, well, three of the writers were from Ukraine, Four. right? All of Four, all well, of Ulitska them, is, right. Well, she was born okay, in Bashkiria, but her right. family is from Ukraine, yes. Does anybody at all write in Ukrainian, and, or, or are there contemporary writers now, perhaps, uh, because the, the 
or Jewish life in Ukraine is very vibrant. So I would think uh, that there would be some authors. Uh, you mentioned uh, Petrovsky Stern. Well, he wrote that book along with Professor Magotchi, yes. Jews and Ukrainians, mm -hmm. uh, which is mm -hmm. quite uh, an interesting uh, study. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But are there any writers? Not that I know, and I'm really, I've been looking for them. There is a poet, uh, Moisei Fishbein, he's mm -hmm. well known and old. Uh, nothing that comes out na now in Ukrainian or in Russian. You have um, Jewish themes in Ukrainian literature, and here again, I'm not an expert, but I can think of two novels. Um, and I think they're used in a kind of instrumental way because they are, these Jewish characters are used for, because they help the author to send a certain message. So Oksana Zabushka's book, uh, it's something of Forgotten mm -hmm. Secret. Um, has, a, I think, a very questionable uh, use of the Jewish character. Then, maybe more interesting, Yuri Benichuk, the Stand of the, the Tango of Death, uh, has a character, the main character, who is a scholar in Lviv and who is deciphering something very ancient, very remote African language, and I think it turns out that's actually Yiddish. That was a language that, you know. Uh, but that's, I think, a Western Ukrainian story. Uh, there have been so much changes, so much transformation and population changes. Eastern Europe, I don't know. I, uh, there are immigrant writers who do write on, on Jewish themes, but anyone now in Ukraine, in Ukrainian, I, I'd love to read it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, just to briefly add to that, I do understand that Hersonsky has started writing in Ukrainian and is publishing a book in Ukrainian um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. in this next year okay. or so. So, and that may be a political statement or um, yeah. some other exploration. But yeah, it's but kind of interesting. Yeah. That's partly, I think, it is a political statement because of his position that is pro-Ukrainian but very critical of the uh, current. Um, uh, he, he also has, interestingly, he uses Ukrainian in his poems, so he would have a dialogue. Uh, where he talks to a patient or to a woman who is ill, and she speaks Ukrainian, he speaks Russian, the way they, they, they actually do. So uh, he's very good in a kind of mimetic reproduction of, of reality, even in poetry, really putting it in the lyrics. So definitely he's absolutely fluent in Ukrainian. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm innocent of most of this literature, but the book that I, I thought was fantastic description of the immigrant experience and the Soviet experience mm -hmm. was David Ben Bezmozgis's Mo uh, The Free World. Yes. Um, and I think maybe next to Stengart, he's the most popular North American writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Petrovsky Stern's book, whose title I forget. The st or the, oh, the first. Um, the Jews and Ukrainians. Choice. Yeah is frankly ridiculous. Uh, he mentions six Jews who wrote in Ukrainian, five, five <laughs> one, of whom was, one of whom was never published, so there was no audience. Uh, the others, Pierre Romaisky and Fishbein, are probably the best known, mm -hmm. but it's, it's an attempt to, at least at the beginning, use the jargon of post-colonialism, which he quickly drops, thankfully, mm -hmm. uh, to say that Jews who wrote in Ukrainian were protesting against Russians. Yeah, all four of them. Um, I think the argument doesn't hold water at all. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't resurrect Petrovsky Stern's unknown writers, unpopular writers, to answer your question about do they write in Ukrainian? Mainly not. And the reasons are very clear. I think that uh, whether it was Lithuanian or Belarusian or Ukrainian, these were the languages of the less educated or uneducated of the Mujik. And Jews strove, as they did in Canada, for example, when they arrived in, say, Montreal, they picked up English rather than French because they sensed that the imperial language and the language of the upper classes, that's the one they wanted, whether it was Russian or English, or in Bohemia and Moravia, German, rather than the local vernaculars. True, but then when you look at literature, one example can actually, <laughs> you know, this proof. So uh, we do have a Lithuanian Jewish writer, it's Hokus Meras. Um, okay, uh, there is a Belarusian. Kanovich is writing in Russian. 
Okay, uh, we have, I uh, forgot his name, there is a Belarusian uh, Jewish writer who came back from Israel and writing in Belarusian. I know of them, right? I don't know of anyone in Ukrainian, so it's, <laughs> I look for them. That's, uh, okay, that's one, but he, he won some kind of prize. Uh, speaking of Bismosgis, mm, you see, I deliberately limited this to Ukraine, because if you add Litvaks, who he is, uh, then you complicate the story immensely. Because for some reason, I don't want to be accused of essentialism. Litvaks don't generate that kind of narrative, that kind of slightly cheesy. They're, they're much more critical of what they're doing. Kanovich has a great, uh, he's a Russian writer uh, who spent his life, his whole life in Lithuania. And Russian is his third language after Yiddish and Lithuanian. Uh, and he considers himself a Russian writer. He writes only about Jews and he's been writing about Jews for many years. So he has a beautiful story as uh, how he, the, nar the narrator, comes to Paris. And he has no money because he comes from a post-Soviet Lithuania. So somebody suggests to him, you know, that these rich Litvaks, they want to hear stories about Vilna. Can you tell them some story? He comes and starts telling the stories, and they pay him, and he makes up all the stories about people. And then he's never been to Vilna. It doesn't <laughs> matter, but he knows how to tell the story. So that kind of critical self-reflection, you, you don't get in, in, this, uh, in this. And I think Bismosgis is, 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 I think, very consciously, and maybe subconsciously, but there is that kind of quality which you also find in Boris Fishman, um, who is another very good American Jew, uh, Russian from Minsk. And with Fishman, it's I mean, just one minute. Um, it's a story about a writer who writes for the kind of the New Yorker, and he's frustrated they don't publish him. So he comes up with making up Holocaust stories and submitting them for application for German money. And he's very successful. He's uh, finally fulfilling himself as a writer. But then a German official comes and says, you know, we know that you're making them up. So we still don't want to pay this money, but just take us, tell us which stories you've made up. So it's, it's this kind of reflection of what you are actually doing. But you don't see this reflection in, uh, in these novels. And I, again, I would not really go as far as to say that there's the difference between <laughs> Lithuanian and Ukrainian Jews, but <laughs> I guess uh, <laughs> that might be. <laughs> Part of it. Maybe um, I'll ask if you can comment a little bit on literature, on Russian Jewish literature being produced in Israel, which is kind of mm -hmm. the one left out of these various diaspora yeah. literatures that you're dealing with. Well, uh, interestingly, there is very little of that kind of type of nostalgic literature written in Hebrew. There are some Russian, not many, there are some writers who write in Hebrew coming from the Soviet Union. Some of them are popular. Um, Ilona, what's it? Kim here. Alona Kim here. Uh, for example, uh, there is, I think, one novel that deals with that kind of theme of return. And my sense is that in Israel, they're not really interested in that kind of uh, nostalgia, in that kind of literature. So, um, in, at least in Hebrew, there's a lot of it. It's in Russian, of course, you know, tons. Uh, but it's not doesn't really make it into into the Hebrew uh, readership. Maybe also because the readership is much smaller. Thank you. Thanks for this talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was thinking about your, your comment about the, the lack of that self-reflection in the Ukrainian uh, literature you're looking at. When you talked about, especially the young American novelist, you were talking about a kind of strategic marketing plan. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like there is some self-reflection. It's just not a kind of ironic self-reflection. Oh, yes. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. um, market-oriented self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, am I reading you right? Yes, with that? yeah, that's exactly what they're trying to say. Uh, there is no uh, kind of undermining uh, from ins this narrative from inside, but definitely there's a lot of uh, strategic thinking put into it, looking at how other, she's not the first one by far, you know, Gary Stengert actually opened that uh, box, and since then it's becoming very popular. Also, uh, I think MFA programs help uh, because they tell you how to write literature, how to write good literature. Uh, I think the New Yorker magazine also helps because David Remnick promotes that kind of literature because he likes Russian Jewish writing. So there are a lot of... Uh, very practical considerations, like practical factors that all come together, but then they produce something that, you know, the Vogue really finds uh, 
nice, warm, and sophisticated. That's, I think, the combination that you really have to kind of very carefully think how much it has to be sentimental warm and how much it has to be really clever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.